Yeah, f this chair. <laughs> yeah, so this is the stupid Vertigear piece of shit. <laughs> uh, how do you really feel about it? I hate it. <laughs> I really hate these chairs. I hate everything about them. This feels like a concrete L. <laughs> We're digging into the topic of office versus gaming chairs and have filled our office with chairs of all varieties to put this roundup together. We even approached a factory and got pricing on our very own Gamers Nexus gaming chair just to see what it really costs to get these chairs made. Gaming chairs are often lazy, lacking innovation, and entirely comprised of copycat designs that relegate their manufacturers to being nothing more than a sticker factory. Peel and stick a new sticker onto the chair each day, and that's your product. We're tired of gaming chair press releases talking about 4D armrests and uh, racing seats. So, it's time to talk about why you shouldn't buy a gaming chair. Before that, this video is brought to you by Thermal Grizzly's Conductonaut Liquid Metal. Conductonaut is what we've used in all of our liquid metal and D-Lit thermal tests, capable of dropping CPU thermals significantly when replacing the stock thermal interface. Lower CPU thermals don't just allow better overclocks, but also lower noise levels because the transfer efficiency is increased. The mix of gallium and indium makes for a thermal conductivity of 73 watts per meter Kelvin, outclassing traditional pastes significantly. Learn more at the link in the description below. This all started when we posted a rant on Twitter and the YouTube community page a while ago about Corsair's then new gaming chair, which came with a press release. Most of the press releases for gaming chairs sound something like this. The chair is described as a racing seat, like those extremely uncomfortable five-point harness seats that are built to hold you in place in the event of a high-force crash. And then it's sold so you can sit in it and type on a keyboard. The chair is claimed as cherished by many an esports team. It probably has broken the laws of physics and somehow has a four-dimensional armrest because they move in four different directions and thus can traverse the space-time continuum. Yet they are the hardest armrests known to man and have invariably hurt our elbows. This chair also uses so-called premium leather. It has two and a half inch casters that might even have a color accent and those are attached to a five-point base with a small logo at the end of each point. The chair has a pillow that buckles through the seatbelt straps on the frame and another that's bound to the top. Yet these pillows somehow cause more spinal discomfort than they solve and the elastic band eventually droops and leaves the headrest pillow limply hanging. The chair has a distinct shape and is marketed as, quote, unique. Yet its unique design also happens to be claimed by literally every single other chair of its kind. And finally, it's called a gaming chair and it costs somewhere between $280 and $500 for a name brand. We were able to get some sales data from Amazon sales through our sleuthing and learned that the video game chairs category has seen approximately 1.2 million units sold in the past nine months, up 101% year over year, thanks to people working from home. The retail sales revenue was about $161 million in that period, according to the source who was able to help us get this information. That's also up over 100%. For perspective, gaming keyboards did about 1.5 million units in that time. In that group, the top selling chair was the GT Racing Gaming Chair, one of the cheaper units that's priced at $150. But the data we collected from sources suggests that this chair has done over $11 million in revenue for the year. Most of you know by now that we're not big fans of the Fainant approach to, quote, making a gaming chair. The companies have become glorified sticker factories as they desperately clamor over one another to cash in on a fat. The assembly lines are staffed with people embroidering or sticking a logo onto something that's otherwise mass-produced and generic, gamer-y, mostly black color. But there's one place that gaming chairs can actually add a lot of value, for now at least, until the office chair companies figure it out. That place is in cross-branding and licensing of known game figures and artwork. They could also start differentiating material selection and actually improving on things rather than buying from the same supplier as their competitors. But that seems like it would take effort, and paying a licensing fee is easier, and still a legitimate advantage that gaming chairs have. For those where looks count, it's an upper hand that office chairs are only just starting to learn with the Logitech partnerships. Everybody wants to get their margin from a product that costs $150 to make at the absolute high end and ship, and sells for $400 or $500 for those. Those numbers, by the way, they're real. There is a company out there selling $400 to $500 chairs that we won't name here that's paying about $150 to get them made and shipped. 
We contacted insiders at some of the biggest companies selling gaming shares. We asked one such insider at a major chair company to answer some anonymous questions. Our first, why does everyone do this and why hasn't anyone tried to make something better? The answer was, word for word, quote, they know this trend won't last long. Everyone just wants to make a quick buck while it lasts, end quote. The anonymous source then encouraged us to make this video to push for improvement in the market. So we broke out the Mandarin and approached some factories selling these chairs in China. We told them that we were interested in making a chair, by which we meant changing the color a bit and adding our logo, much like many of the companies on the market are doing now. One of them is located in Zhejiang in China. It's a province, and they're a major manufacturer of chairs. The company told us that it was interested in making our chair that we're never bringing to market, to be very clear on that. And the company also told us that it OEMs for MSI Steel Series and apparently claims that it OEMs for Cooler Master, although uh, it didn't really sound like they actually do. But they had a prototype that they made at some point. So when we say all these chairs come from the same places, the same factories, same factory floors, we really do mean it. A lot of them do genuinely come from the same places, or at least source the materials from the same places to be assembled elsewhere. The quote we received from the company, though, was what you see here. We asked them to customize one of their models. We upgraded from the lowly 3D armrests into extra-dimensional, time-traversing 4D armrests. Although, due to a language barrier, we were unable to really verify if they can truly travel time. We also upgraded to a metal base from a plastic one. We added a more powerful gas lift for our American market, which they recommended, by the way, and we were quoted at 400 units. Cost was $75 per unit before negotiations. We didn't waste time negotiating since we're not actually wasting our time making this product, but a manufacturer familiar with the product told us that $65 is doable for this spec. Now, of course, only 400 of these fit in a 40 HQ shipping container, which we'd have to rent and putting those on the ocean isn't particularly cheap either. That also takes 45 to 60 days, so there's more time cost involved. Warehousing a huge chair, even a bad one, is also expensive in square footage cost if it doesn't move. Further still, manufacturers selling through Newegg and Amazon bake massive retailer margins into their MSRP. Despite a $75 cost to make this product, plus some shipping cost, Newegg will request a net PPM, or net pure margin, of something fairly high, like 35% on average, after accounting for any free shipping or subsidized shipping that they offer. Everyone thinks their Amazon shipping is free and then complains when having to pay an independent seller to ship a large object across the country. But you're still paying for it at Amazon. It's just somewhere else. Everyone raises the price of the product. If Newegg is only at 25% PPM, for instance, the manufacturer then has to give a 10% rebate back in our example, often in the form of MDF, or Marketing Development Fund. So to help illustrate things here, depending on the size of the manufacturer and the volume they're doing, in speaking with one of the companies that does make chairs, a $200 MSRP gaming chair sold on Amazon would mean Amazon's cost should be somewhere around $100, and then a 20% MDF might be needed beyond that. So this means that the manufacturer would need its bomb to be under $80 in order to not lose money, and that doesn't count things like the actual time cost on it, and if they do any, although none of them really seem to, R&D cost, and then things like shipping or import. So we still think you shouldn't buy a gaming chair, but we wanted to illustrate that although the pricing does look insane when you just look at the bomb, there's a bit more to it than that. That said, a lot of these chairs are still absolutely insane margin, and then the ones that run cheaper are really high volume, as we showed earlier. So the reason we think you shouldn't buy a gaming chair isn't just because of the price, it's because they suck. That's the main one. The issues arise when you're paying $400 to $500 to a direct seller, bypassing the retailers. Similarly priced office chairs, meanwhile, often end up more comfortable, ergonomically sound, and supportive of the body. Today, we're comparing this list of chairs. We have two models of VertiGear gaming chairs and about six total in the office. We've had others in the past and still do, like Noble chairs, but fortunately, even just two models is enough to understand functionally all of the so-called gaming chairs on the market. They're basically all the same. It might not have a Corsair, MSI, NZXT, or HyperX logo, but we could just stick one on and it, you'd get the idea. We have a Herman Miller Aeron chair that we bought brand new for $1,200 US. 
We will also be considering used Aeron chairs, which were priced by liquidators at $200 to $400 before everyone started to work from home and bought them all. Our goal with this one will be to determine whether it's really worth the price, as it's often cited as the best chair for people serious about their posture. We also got an Ergo Chair 2 from Autonomous.ai which is about $350 and is branded as an office chair that claims to, quote, provide back support and prevent back pain and improve sitting posture. We bought an $80 chair from Amazon, and it's similar to an Amazon Basics chair that was sold just a few months ago. This one is called the Smug Desk 0581F, but it's just a generic office chair on the cheap. Another chair we purchased was the Comin Mesh Ergonomic Office Chair. We paid about $234 for it originally, but it's $280 now. Because chairs are so subjective, it's tough to review them in a roundup. So we did some internal qualitative analysis, and part of this involved blindly testing the team. I assembled all of the chairs in a separate room and then had each team member come out blindfolded to try the chair out and attempt to identify two things. One, which chair did they think it was? I had told them the options, but they hadn't ever seen some of them. And then two, how much did they think it costs based only on how it felt to sit in? So some of these chairs were never seen by the team. The Vertigear ones had been seen by everyone because we used to use them here. And the results were pretty interesting. Here's a short sequence of some of the best thoughts. If you compress your eyes hard enough, do, does the blood stop flowing to them? Uh... I think in this position, the standard position. The standard position. I think in this position, if the seat feels too small, I would put this one at bottom two. It seems cheap, but comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> this one goes back the furthest so far. Okay. Uh... I'm not a chair reviewer by trade. <laughs> I should say that. This, this is a good chair. I think I would say that this one is less expensive, but that doesn't mean it's uncomfortable. This is the smallest chair so far. <laughs> I don't want to say this is a $60 one just because it's the tiniest of all the chairs. Yeah, I like this one. It's like got like a rubberized. I don't feel like I'm sliding downhill when I sit in it. <laughs> this is a very sweaty chair to sit in. I'll put this on the bottom because I want to replace it. First one is over this way. <laughs> this does not feel expensive. Ooh. All right, I'm done. I just like, I sit in it and it's fine. I'm not being poked in an annoying places. All right, this definitely feels like a cheap one. This is the least complicated that I've managed to find controls for. Yeah, f this chair. <laughs> yes, this is the stupid Vertigear piece of <laughs> The immediate takeaway from this is that obviously this isn't enough to review a chair, but it's an interesting experiment. And some chairs take a really long time to properly evaluate. For instance, the cheapest chair we bought felt fine initially, but after a week of use, it had mostly flattened in the cushion and become one of the least comfortable chairs that we purchased. Now, eight months later, that particular chair, it's akin to sitting on a piece of metal or stiff cardboard, even though it felt fine originally. On the opposite end of things, the $1,200 Aeron chair had some of the most critical reception initially when the blindfolds were in play. Several of our team members actually thought that the Ergo Chair 2, which isn't mesh at the bottom, but uh, they were trying not to cheat by feeling for that, thought that the Ergo 2 was the Aeron chair upon first contact, which, if anything, should flatter the Ergo chair too. The Comin mesh chair also got high praise from the team. I would say it's in the top three most expensive. Okay. Maybe even top two. This seems nice. I'll, I'll say uh, 500. I would put this one at bottom two. I, I'll say 250 for this one. Maybe be an expensive one or a knockoff of an expensive one. I would say knockoff of an expensive one. Let's start with these so-called gaming chairs, then move on to the others. Every gaming chair we've used here, despite the costs, has been an overpriced, shoulder-constricting future back problem at its core. At a product level, there's zero innovation. And while a lot of companies are guilty of failing to advance their products, the guiltiest include component brands, SIs, and RGB makers 
who don't even try to add something different from their competition. It's shameless. The name of the factory might as well be Control-C, Control-V. No one in the office liked our Vertigear or Noble gaming chairs when compared to even a $200 office chair. And that's against $400 plus dollar gaming chairs. So to share the opinions of people working here, let's go through a couple of shots from the blind test we did. Ew. <laughs> oh. Hmm. Ew. <laughs> I know this chair. No, this does not feel expensive. This feels like Vertigear. How do you... Do, so do you like it? <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I hate it as much as the other one. I, I couldn't tell them if apart. So... One could be coarse. Well, I guess if it was Corsair, it would have RGB and I'd be able to see it through the mask, but... The real problem we have with gaming chairs is that there's really no effort. It's not fair to say, but it's a chair, and ask how much you can innovate because clearly office chair companies have it figured out. The Herman Miller Aeron, for instance, uses all mesh, something gaming chairs haven't really discovered yet. It doesn't have to be $1,200 either. All three of our main office chairs, starting at $220 for one off Amazon, also have more intuitive controls to exactly position every aspect of the lockout or range of movement, something that gaming chairs often only do with one lackluster lever. Many of the office chairs have better wheels that are less destructive on carpets, have better bearings, the adjusters have more precision for posture and lumbar support, and some even have armrests that aren't this bullshit pretend wannabe rubberized material. Back when we reviewed the Noble Chair's icon, the company argued with us that its armrests weren't as hard and elbow abusing as we said, claiming that they were soft. Like other gaming chairs we've tested though, they're hard as rocks plastic. These chairs aren't particularly conducive to nerd sweat in a lawn-seated session, either. The only thing less breathable than a Vertigear pleather chair is an NZXT case, but at least the NZXT case doesn't make you sweaty. Maybe the Thermaltake chair fans weren't such a stupid idea after all. These chairs often have seats that are too deep, unintentionally encouraging slouching to the extreme, like the nearly prone position our editor Andrew used to assume when he used these chairs. Being able to sit that far forward means, we think, a higher likelihood of leaning in a way that's actually bad for your body. Not enough people take posture seriously when working or gaming, and that's something that needs to change. The seats on some models have also become flat with time, which means less support around the legs. The racing-like wings near the harness holes do the opposite. They lift and push our shoulders forward into peak programmer neck posture. And this wasn't something we'd noticed as truly uncomfortable until we switched to better chairs. It's Stockholm Syndrome in action when you start to use these for a long time. Although we aren't doctors, these chairs tweak body posture and position enough that, as a company, we've made the decision to try and replace them with real office chairs at every desk where someone might sit for a long period of time. The Herman Miller Aeron chair is next. It's iconic and known to most IT office buildings in at least America, if not the world. It's also why, pre-pandemic, they could be easily had for 200 to 300 bucks in good used condition from office liquidation sales. Back when our tweet landed on the front page of Reddit complaining about gaming chairs, we noticed it was the most commonly recommended chair by the anti-gaming chair crowd. We bought one, just to include it in this roundup, because of that. There's definitely an executive effect on this chair. It's not just parts that are getting marked up. It's the fact that it ships pre-assembled and in a massive box. Of course, the shipping cost is disguised as free, but it's absolutely part of the $1,200 price tag we paid. That'd be a couple hundred bucks to ship a box that size plus the assembly fee, but it's nice to wheel a chair out of a box and immediately be able to sit in it. No assembly required, but most people would probably rather trade the time for the money. In a time-saving sense, there is a wide business audience that would rather pay for the service than pay with the time, so it's a trade. I've personally been using this chair for about seven to eight months now purchasing it after we got fed up with gaming chairs and started this roundup. The Aeron chair definitely has the finest tuning available of all the chairs tested. Even still, sitting in it after first opening it, the immediate feeling was one of disappointment. It was sort of an, oh, well, that's not $1,200 special. The price makes it feel like it's going to be world-changing immediately when you put your ass in the seat. But it really isn't. This chair took some time to wear in. 
and it takes some tuning to really get it dialed properly. You have to try. It needs configuration, just like overclocking. The levers at the bottom can be adjusted to lock the back into new positions every couple degrees, which helps enforcing good posture. The chair's arms aren't that soft, but they have some give in a way that's still supportive, and we'd classify these as significantly improved over all the others, even the separate memory foam cushions. The armrest height can be carefully tuned with a lever in the back. The tilt and resistance can be adjusted, and the mesh has lasted without any loss of elasticity over this past year or so. Unlike the cheaper of the mesh chairs we have, the mesh seat has remained taut and isn't sagging under load of nerds. With time, we've all come to appreciate it as being a technical best in positioning and forcing better posture. That's the main thing about it. It initially felt uncomfortable because, as Andrew on our team said, it's undoing years of incorrect sitting habits. It's worth $1,200 to some wealthier people, but clearly not everyone can stretch that far, even if they believe the long-term use is worth it. It's expensive. For people who feel like it's just too much, but still want something that's like it, cheaper office chairs are up next, and used Aeron's would probably be a good compromise at the next liquidation sale. So, in a sense, these might be quote-unquote worth it, but that doesn't matter if you still can't afford it or justify it with so many other things in life that need to be paid for. This next chair is one that we've lovingly titled the Amazon chair. Although it's technically made by a different company, it's curiously similar to an Amazon Basics chair. It's the cheapest we bought, and it sells for between $60 and $90. This one is actually surprisingly comfortable for the first 300 milliseconds that you sit in it after which time the cushion has sunken to meet what feels like a stiff cardboard base. This has been an issue true for the lightweight among us, too. Patrick has the same issue of sinking to the cardboard as I do. After about a week of daily use, the chair was already showing signs of wear. The cushion no longer offered any comfort, and the chair developed an ass-numbing superpower that slowly turned into a feet-numbing superpower. You'll want to shift your weight a lot in this chair to prevent that issue from happening. The hardened plastic armrest began to cause discomfort in the elbows as well. There are several human factors issues at play with this chair. The first is its height, where all the other chairs can easily be raised to meet a standard 28 to 30 inch tall desk. With the chair height at about 21 to 22 inches, the Amazon chair maxes out at around 18 to 19 inches height at the top of the cushion, or an actual height closer to 17 since it compresses. That's four to five inches below where we need the chairs to be comfortably situated for what we consider to be an ideal ergonomic position with minimized negative impact to wrists. Other than that, the chair does offer a mesh back that seems to hold up, and the base is, to its credit, metal rather than plastic, making it presumably less likely to explode and send you flying to the floor. As for the wheels, they're causing damage to the carpet. The bearings are noticeably bad and they grind. The verdict on this chair is that it seems better than literally nothing. I think, though, I'd rather sit on an exercise ball than this chair. This chair would mostly be an upgrade to someone sitting in a dining room chair right now or something similarly hard. We added $10 pads to it for the armrests, and it significantly improved the quality, but it doesn't fix the height issues or the adjustment options. This chair is highly disposable and it's not meant to last long. If you can afford it, buy something better. It'll last longer and produce less waste in the landfills, but also feel better. If not, try finding a used office chair that was better to begin with. That said, despite most of our team not liking it, our GN store distributor loves chairs like this and has many of them, and Keegan said he'd prefer this chair to the gaming chairs, which he'd only give to his worst enemies, so your mileage may vary. The Comine Mesh Chair is the next one, and this was the first chair that we bought when we moved into the new office, so we've had it for about two years now. We paid 220 to 230 ish for it, and this is the only chair that's been somewhat fought over. Whichever video editor comes in first for the day is the one who normally takes the chair, and if someone's out, it gets swapped away from that person's desk. We'll probably buy more eventually. The chair is entirely made of plastic, so it looks and feels cheap. But it's mesh material for the bottom and the back, and Keegan in particular likes it for keeping his posture. Patrick says he'd probably buy this chair for himself. I used this chair for about a year before swapping, but I swapped mostly because the wheels were destroying the carpet. Since I'm here the longest hours, it causes the most damage. The more normal hours the other guys work don't seem to have that problem yet. We'd recommend an aftermarket wheel upgrade for it, or maybe a plastic sheet to put under it. The chair has developed a loud creak with age, so it definitely requires some maintenance. But the mesh so far is holding up. The chair wouldn't work well for heavier people, so 
We disagree with its claim that it can quote unquote support 300 pounds. Maybe the plastic and the base can't structurally, but the mesh base will absolutely sag once it's dealing with anywhere close to that weight. The chair has the usual levers on it. The left side can lock the back in place or change how forward the back is positioned, which is a nice touch. The right is the usual height adjust, and it's a standard max height. The chair includes a mesh headrest that's somewhat adjustable. The arms are one of the biggest annoyances overall, though. They can be lifted up, which is nice for anyone who might play guitar or bass while seated, but they can't be adjusted in height. This can be a problem for aligning them with the table, so you end up adjusting the height of the entire chair just to get the armrests at the right height. The start height is still better than the smug desk chair's armrests, though. This chair breathes well, and it doesn't get hot. It's simple, it's entirely plastic, so again, it's not aging too well after two years, but disassembling it and re-greasing the parts would buy some time. We're expecting things to maybe start breaking in an, an irreparable way by the four-year mark of ownership, but overall, that's pretty good lifespan for a chair that's considered to be cheap in a sense compared to the other mesh chairs on the market. And this is one that we could reasonably recommend if you're on more of a budget but still want a mesh chair. The last one we'll talk about is the Ergo Chair 2 from Autonomous.ai. This one has a lot of copycats lately, so it's clearly become a popular style from Autonomous. The Ergo Chair 2 is $350 now and is immediately and observedly better in build quality and material choice than the Komin mesh chair. It's also a lot more expensive though. It does have downsides, but to its credit, this is one that two people thought was an Aeron chair when they were blindfolded. The Ergo chair, unlike the others, has a cushioned base, so that's always a point of concern for compression. Thus far, it's aging well and it hasn't compressed within the last eight months of constant use. The arms are adjustable, making it easier to align with the desk, but they have this horribly annoying defect or design flaw, we're not sure which, where they don't lock into place. The arms slide forward and back, and although we think they're supposed to lock, ours don't. They're also hard, like concrete, so this is one where a $10 armrest cushion would have been worthwhile, and we're not sure why none of these chair companies offer it. The Ergo Chair 2 was most praised in the office for lumbar support and for overall build quality of a mid-range office chair. The most criticized aspect has been its lack of a mesh base, with the team complaining uniformly about feeling hot after working longer hours. The chair has a headrest that's adjustable, but it snaps back horribly loudly with some pressure and sounds like someone's neck is snapping. Patrick's verdict has been that he thought he disliked the chair more than he does, so that's sort of praise from us, and Keegan says it's his second choice after the Comin mesh chair. He passed on the Aeron because, as is a valid concern, he didn't get into the weeds of setup enough to ever position it fully properly. The Ergo Chair 2 is one of the best built chairs that we worked with maybe behind the Aeron, and at $350, that's a pretty good mark to hit. We'd rank it as superior to the gaming chairs in basically every single way, except the armrests, which are flawed in all the same ways those are. The base is much more comfortable, the positioning is better, at least in our opinion for ergonomics, and the build quality is higher and it doesn't get anywhere near as hot as the gaming chairs do, while also being softer in just about every place except the armrests. So the Ergo Chair 2 would be our choice if you wanted a cushion for the base rather than mesh, or if you wanted a chair with a larger base in general. We shot everything before this point in about August of 2020, and then we just let it all sit. And in the last four months, we've had even more use in the chairs, now December 2020, and our opinions remain the same. The most interesting thing out of all of this was how everybody thought during the blind test that the Aeron chair was one of the cheaper ones. And each blind test, we spent about 20 minutes with each person from GN, so you only saw a really short part of it, but the intent of each conversation was conveyed pretty fully in the clips we chose. And everyone thought that Aeron one was cheaper. So this maybe speaks to tempering expectations if you are going to buy one, in that you won't sit in it and immediately feel like it's the best chair you've ever sat in, most likely. Now, it's possible that you've only sat in chairs that uh, maybe it's the perfect chair for exactly you out of the box, and in that case, you'd feel great about it. But the real key takeaway here is that these more expensive chairs, the cost isn't necessarily in you sit in it and feel great. It's in there's a lot of mechanics to it that you can adjust. For all this talk about chairs though, there's one aspect that we haven't brought up yet and I didn't see brought up in the other office chair reviews that I've read. And that's one of fitness. So 
I found that personally speaking, getting back into more core strengthening exercises did more for my posture than anything else. And obviously I'm not talking about going crazy with fitness because uh, I'm not a picture of that. But doing some basics for core strength really helped a lot in maintaining a better posture for a longer period of time, more so than any single chair upgrade did. So that's maybe something to consider if you're not already doing stuff like that uh, and add that to your routine to encourage a better posture. It re has reduced the amount that I've slouched. Now this all uh, kind of got thrown out the window when I, a few months before my recent surgery and then with the surgery, there's some recovery time. So can't continue doing that for a little while yet, but it's been the, the biggest thing that I've looked forward to getting back into because it helps so much with sort of keeping that lower back strength and keeping your body situated in a way where you're not just like lazily slouching over. It's also important, of course, to remember to get up and walk around or stretch every now and then too throughout the day while you're working. Uh, this has helped, just personally speaking, me maintain a certain level of energy and focus to get up every now and then and just not look at a screen and stretch out a little bit. Uh, so these things can help just as much or more than just a chair upgrade. If you're trying to get the perfect chair, there might be another component to it that uh, that you could potentially be missing. As for the gaming chairs, even though our titles probably don't buy a gaming chair, that's more of an overall warning, but there are some reasons you might still buy it. Uh, one of our guys here likes the white and blue Vertigear chair we have. It's an older one, and clearly they work well for some body types, some people, and that's okay. They also have value in the department of looks that can't really yet be matched by the office chair companies. So maybe you're buying a chair for your teenager who just likes to have the coolest looking setup possible out of all of their friends. In that instance, sure. You can't really do better than a gaming chair for the looks department in most of these sort of computer DIY gaming setup scenarios. For professionals or people who are maybe feel like they're getting a little bit older and want to focus more on the longer term effects of things that they use every day, our recommendation, we are not doctors or physical therapists or anyone really qualified, you should talk to, to one of those people for uh, firm recommendations for you specifically. But uh, just speaking from a professional environment, people who use chairs all day to do the work that we do, our recommendation is to consider the office chairs because even the 200-ish, 280 I think it is now, Comin office chair that we bought, uh, that's one of the cheaper office chairs. It's cheaper than a lot of the name brand gaming chairs out there like Vertigear and Noble and so forth. Even that one has been fought over by my team. I'm probably gonna buy more of them because everybody wants to use that chair. So whoever comes in first for the day takes that chair. So, so our opinion then just as computer professionals is that a cheaper office chair, cheaper being relative here, uh, compared to a similarly priced gaming chair seems to on average provide more benefit than the gaming chair would. That might not be true for everyone, that's fine. Please enjoy the chair that you buy if you like it. Uh, we don't want people to feel buyer's remorse over it if, they, if you like your chair. But all that said, keep in mind that it's easy to buy a chair that's too wide, too narrow, or needs adjustment that might not be possible with that chair. So take the dimensions seriously into account when you're shopping for a chair, look at the dimensions of the seat, check your own dimensions, and then determine if it's a seat that's going to be too wide or too narrow, because in our search for the right chair for everybody, that's been one of the number one factors where having a chair that's too wide encourages sort of leaning to one side or the other and bending your spine in a way that's maybe not great. Uh, so that's something to nail down and just take the dimensions seriously. There's, there's more to it than just whether it has mesh or not unlike a lot of cases, uh, it does come down to the sizing of it, the sizing of your desk, uh, and other factors, human factors. So that's it for this one. Thank you for watching. As always, subscribe for more. You can go to store.gamersaccess.net to pick up some of our products. We will not be selling the gaming chair though, or you can go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus. We'll see you all next time.